Like, it just used to be me, her, and my sister. Like, we were all of us girls, and we did a lot of things together. I need an ambulance. That's a problem. My daughter has taken some pills. Sounds like there's something in her throat. And then try to murder her own flesh and blood. I hate my mother for ruining so many people's lives. Police medications, can I help you? I need a safety caster. My husband didn't show up to work this morning. I don't know what's going on. Because you've been poisoning him from Friday night on. We're headed to you. What you did to David Castor can only be described as premeditated torture. Now, as bad and as evil as that is, what you tried to do to your daughter, Ashley, is simply something that I find I almost can't comprehend. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my True Crime with Some channel. I am so excited to get this case out to you all today, and thank you again for all your ongoing support. It means the world to me. I'm enjoying this channel so, so much, honestly, more than you could know. Um, but... Please subscribe if you haven't already and give it a thumbs up and make sure you stay till the end and then comment and we can discuss things about the case as I love your comments. All your comments mean the world to me. It's, my favorite. it's probably my favourite part. But yeah, we're just going to jump straight in. Today we are going to be talking about Stacey Castor. She is a woman who poisoned her husband, then blamed it on her daughter. She is a very um, sick and twisted woman extremely sick and twisted as you can probably tell already by the explanation of it and I'm gonna be talking about that case today July 24th 1967 Stacy was born as Stacy Ruth Daniels in Clay in New York in America and her parents were Jerry Daniels who was a car salesman and Judy Eaton, a stay-at-home mum. She also had an older brother named Jamie and a sister called Darcy. There's not too much to say about her early life, but she was known to be a very happy, jolly, just normal girl. And obviously, because her mum was a stay-at-home mum, she was close with her mum and the house was always busy, had people in, always someone was home. Her mother Judy said that her daughter once envisioned great things for herself, saying she was very intelligent and that she wanted to be a paralegal or a lawyer and she actually began taking the suitable classes for this so she obviously wanted to actually pursue a career in law so she was very clever and driven at this point. That was until 1985 when Stacy met Michael Wallace. Stacey was 17 at this time, so very young, and Michael was 23. They met at a bar, I don't know how she got in a bar, underage, but... And they honestly bonded just immediately, and Michael Wallace, or Mike, I might call him Michael or Mike in this case, he was described as larger than life, always the life of the party, and if you needed something, Mike had it and he would give it to you. He was very party animal based. Stacy felt that Michael was the love of her life and she actually said that after five minutes of meeting him she knew she was going to marry him and on April 7th 1990 that came true and Stacy and Michael got married. It was just a little small ceremony but they both looked very happy. The couple had their first daughter Ashley in 1988 so a bit prior to when they got married and they also had their second daughter Brie in 1991. Stacy actually worked for an ambulance dispatch company and Mike worked as a mechanic so they were very they were always at work and their schedules didn't really line up very well and Michael would I don't know be doing the day shift or Stacy would be doing the night shift so they wouldn't really be that much around each other too much. To outsiders it looked like a very strong marriage and Stacy's mother said that her daughter was as happy as she'd ever been and Stacy to other people seemed extremely well suited for motherhood. Stacy said that the minute Ashley was born she knew her whole reason was to protect and take care of her daughter. But all wasn't too well beneath the surface because Michael actually had a drink and a drugs problem according to Stacy and other people other people. Now he did struggle with this quite a lot and also said that they had no money so they were clearly struggling besides both of them always working. Now according to Stacy, Michael was very close to Brie, their younger daughter, and because he showed a special favouritism towards the younger daughter, Stacy tried to make up for this and she became 
best friends with Ashley, favouritising Ashley so that she didn't feel left out. Danny Coleman, one of Stacey's old friends, actually said that um, Brie was daddy's little angel and that she could do no wrong in her dad Michael's eyes. And I think it's so strange how they had a favourite child. Very, very odd. Yeah, okay. I just thought I'd mention that because it will come apparent later on. Now, due to Michael's drink and drug issues, he actually landed himself in prison for a short while. It wasn't too long. I think it was due to DUI charges. And when he came out, he decided that he wanted to change and he did actually change. He wanted to do this for his family, his children, his wife probably. And he did actually make a change. Despite Michael changing for the better and how close they all were to their children, the couple grew apart and towards the end of 1999, Stacey suspected that Michael was having an affair. This isn't confirmed, but she suspected that. And she actually told a close friend of hers about this and said that they're thinking of getting a divorce. Stacey claims that the couple didn't get a divorce because they didn't want to do it at Christmas because it was by Christmas time, as they wanted to give their kids a nice Christmas, which is completely understandable. So she thought, oh, we'll just get divorced in the new year of 2000. However, that would never actually happen. In the winter of 1999, Michael Wallace fell severely ill. His daughter Ashley remembered that he had a really hard time walking, talking, and she said that one time her dad just got up off the sofa, vomited all over the coffee table, and then just went back to sleep like nothing happened. Literally nobody knew what was wrong with Mike, and so he sought medical attention. Michael told the doctors that he constantly felt drunk besides the fact he'd not drank anything so that was very strange. The doctors were completely stumped, they did not know what to do. It was literally a mystery. One doctor even said that maybe it was an inner ear disorder. Michael just kept deteriorating more and more, his condition was awful until January 11th, 2000, he died. His daughter, Ashley, eldest daughter, who was age 12 at the time, had arrived home from school and she saw her dad and he was making strange faces, he was gurgling, just did not look good at all. Ashley, she's young, she didn't really know what to do, so she just put the TV on and then all of a sudden, Mike lifted his arm up and then it just dropped down and he had passed away. Now, obviously, Ashley didn't really know what to do. She was very, she was terrified, obviously. So she ran out the house and went to go and pick her younger sister, Brie, up from school. Meanwhile, Stacy comes home. She finds her husband, Michael, dead on the sofa. And she calls 911. And also she calls her mother to look after the girls. This was extremely shocking, especially for his daughters and his family as they said he died from most likely a heart attack, but he was only 38, so this is very rare. It can happen, but it's rare, and there wasn't really any signs to, to it. Michael's parents and sister found it so, so strange that they persevered to try and get an autopsy done on their, their son. But Stacy declined this, because she's the wife and she can decide, and she said it's because that she believes the doctors and that she had no reason to question the doctors, which I think is very strange. If you were genuinely a wife that wanted to know what had happened to your husband who all of a sudden died, the father of your children, why wouldn't you just get an autopsy? It's very, very strange. Stacey had Michael buried in a plot in a cemetery that she had also put next to herself. So like she pre-bought it and that was going to be her plot. Stacey Castor, she, um, she quietly moved on. She collected Michael's $55,000 life insurance. Stacey took her daughter to Disney World after their father died, which ta that, that's fine. Like you're trying to cheer them up. And two others, it looked like... Stacy was a grieving mum, a grieving widow, and she was trying to help her kids get through their grief. Bree said that they were really close, they enjoyed having fun at home together, watching TV, and generally just acting like three best pals. At some point, Stacy got a new job, so she's not working for the ambulance anymore, and this is where she very quickly moved on. Just one year after her husband Michael died, she began dating David Castor. 
So the pair actually met through their boss. David was described as very conscientious, work-driven, very into the outdoors. He had snowmobiles, four-wheelers and a boat. Stacy later said that David was a strength and a support for her. And to be fair, David's just described as very opposite to Michael, which probably is what she liked. And in my opinion, I think they literally look like so similar. Is that just me? I know it's really not relevant, but I think they literally, I kept getting confused at which photo was who, because they look so similar. David Castor actually had a son who was David Junior. So he was David Senior and his son was grown up at this point and obviously, Stacey had her two children, Ashley and Brie. The pair got married in August 2003 and she took his surname from here on. That's why she's known as Stacey Castor. Stacey said that her daughters weren't too happy about the marriage and they didn't want their father replaced. He wouldn't be replaced because David was not interested in the girls whatsoever. He saw them as an inconvenience. He didn't want to be a father. He He's, even though he had a son, but he was grown up. And even though the girls were teens by this time, and they, were, they weren't children, really, he just was very harsh with them. He didn't show any love or support or any fatherly anything to them at all. He was very difficult with the kids and he expected them to do exactly as he said. Now, David Senior's son, David Jr. was the son of long time marriage to his high school sweetheart. David Jr. described home as a happy home with a lot of togetherness. They were just a great family. Things went very downhill, however, after David Sr. got into a tragic accident. He was testing a dirt bike and he just flew off. This was in front of his son and wife and they thought he was dead. He flew off, luckily he didn't die, but he did have a severe head injury. And according to his son, his personality changed a lot. He, his son said that he didn't have a lot of consideration to people or love and he didn't understand how what he said would make them feel, which is common in severe head injuries. David Jr. believes this is why his mum left his dad. His ex-wife said that after the accident, David Senior just became very unbearable and controlling, so she left him. The father and son actually became alienated. They did not speak, and David Senior found comfort in his relationship with Stacey. David Senior was the owner of Liverpool Heating and Air Conditioning, so it was a air conditioning company, and he made himself a very nice living, as you can guess, he's the owner of a place. Eventually Stacy actually went to work for him as an office manager and this is extremely different. Now she's working with her husband whereas before with my, with my with Michael they never saw each other they were never working together and this was extremely different and it's not it's not clear if Stacy ever loved David. I don't think she did and you'll see why but I don't know it yeah it's think she did. That brings us to Monday, August 22nd, 2005. Stacy phoned 911 very frantically saying that her husband had not turned up to work. Obviously that's because they worked together so she would know he wouldn't, he hadn't turned up. She claimed that she last spoke to him 5am on Sunday, so this was Monday now, when he locked her out of the bedroom. Police communications, can I help you? My name is Stacey Castor. My husband didn't show up to work this morning. I don't know what's going on. I'm just getting a little concerned because I haven't talked to him since 5 o'clock in the morning on Sunday when he locked me out of the bedroom. Has he ever mentioned hurting himself or harming himself? Well, or Friday night when we were arguing, he told me to get out, take my kids and get out. I could leave. And then five minutes later, he said if I left, he would make me sorry. I would be sorry if I ever left. It was quite a strange call. And according to Stacey, her and David had had a very big argument about their anniversary vacation. And basically, David wanted it to just be him and Stacy that went and Stacy wanted to bring their her two children along well they weren't children they were pretty grown up by this point she wanted to bring them along and obviously we know David isn't the biggest fan of them he didn't want them and this 
erupted into a huge argument. The fight got so bad that David told Stacey to leave and to take her two daughters with her. The last time she apparently saw David was when he locked himself in the bedroom with a bottle of alcohol, insinuating that he was gonna get drunk. Ashley and Brie had left the house that weekend because their mum had told them to. But according to Stacey, she stayed behind, staying all of Saturday night and into the early hours of Sunday morning. Even though when Stacey was trying to get David's attention, knocking on the door, etc., he was not responding. She just thought, oh, it's fine. He's probably just sleeping off the alcohol. And she could also hear, hear him sleeping. I'm guessing like snoring or... Yeah, that's what she said though. Stacey tells the dispatcher that she went to stay at a friend's house Sunday night and went straight to work Monday from the friend's house. Lastly, she made sure to mention that David was suicidal. She really wanted the dispatcher to know this and she's because she said it's because his father had recently passed and he'd been very depressed. Two officers were then sent over to the house and they got no response at all. So Sergeant Robert Willoughby decided to kick down the door and when he did, he discovered a horrific scene. David Castor was naked, face down on the bed, surrounded by his own vomit everywhere. David was pronounced dead at the age of 48. The officers remember that Stacy screamed, he's not dead, he's not dead. Now, in the bedroom, police found some quite interesting things at first. Look around. Next to the bed on a nightstand were two drinking glasses, one which contained a green liquid, and on the floor was an empty bottle of antifreeze. A lab later on found that the liquid in the bottle the liquid in the glass was the antifreeze. There was also a turkey baster found in the kitchen with traces of antifreeze in. It was said that it appeared to be a simple suicide by antifreeze poisoning. Stacy kept really claiming that it was because he was depressed because of his father dying, really trying to make out that he definitely was suicide. However, David's family and those who knew him, including his ex-wife Janice, completely detested this idea that he just would not commit suicide. There was a lot of very strange things in this case that people found odd. They became very suspicious. And what's also weird is it turned out David had no alcohol in his system when apparently he took that bottle into the room, locked himself in, got himself into like a drunken stupor. He died from ingesting ethylene, glycol which is the poisonous compound found in antifreeze. Investigators thought it was very strange for David to choose this way of ending his own life as it's very slow and very painful and they found it even weirder when they discovered that they actually had a gun in their house so why would David choose this option of suicide? Lead detective Dominic Spinelli found it suspicious when Stacy let on that she knew that the poison ethylene glycol was the main component of antifreeze. Stacy, who had received over $50,000 from her first husband, now was going to gain $200,000 roughly from David. David's ex-wife Janice said he had motorcycles, jet skis, snowmobiles, a house, a business, and I figured that Stacy had made plans to take it all, which sounds about right. Stacy produced a fake will that left everything to her, her and her daughters, but absolutely nothing to his son, David Jr., who they had actually made up at that point. So it was very strange he'd left nothing to his own son and everything to the daughters and Stacy, especially when he didn't like the daughters. After David's death, detectives tapped Stacy's phone line and detective Dominic Spinelli remained skeptical and began an investigation that would last two years. When they went to the cemetery, they realized that Stacy actually's had another husband pass away, which, I mean, it happens, but it's awfully bad luck, isn't it? And it's weird because they were put next to each other. They were buried next to each other. So on September 5th, 2007, they upped the stakes. They were really starting to suspect Stacy now. And they had the body of Stacy's first husband, Mike Wallace, exhumed. Spinelli actually said, quote, I remember thinking while Michael Wallace's casket came out of the ground, I wonder if he's saying, it's about time you guys are looking at this because I didn't just die on my own. 
So he obviously suspected Stacy very strongly. Stacy claimed that Michael Wallace had all sorts of medical issues, but when his medical records were taken and they looked in them. The worst thing that had ever happened to him was that he had a hernia, which that does not scream oh, he had loads of medical issues. Police suspected that Stacy had poisoned both of her husbands with antifreeze. A painful death at least the formation of crystals in the victim's organs, which is absolutely terrifying. After the autopsy of Michael Wallace's body, Sergeant Michael Norton remembered that the medical examiner told him that Michael Wallace was loaded with crystals. His literal organs were glowing with it. Now, police had set up a camera at Stacy's home and also one at the graveyard where her husband was buried and authorities wiretapped her phone. It was in one of these calls that they heard her have on the phone that they found out that Stacy had been to the cemetery soon after Michael's body had been exhumed. September 7th 2007 Stacy was brought in for questioning and Spinelli's line of questions received a very strange response throughout from Stacy. Quote, I asked Stacy, do you remember which glass you poured the cranberry juice in? She looked at it and said, well, when I poured the anti-free, I, and then she stopped and said, I mean, I mean the cranberry juice, which, oh my God, how can you mess up that bad? How can you mess up that, that bad? She literally nearly accidentally said, I poured the anti-free. She's forgetting the Z off of it. I think she just thinks it's called anti-free, but she nearly just literally confessed. And the detective picked up on this slip of the tongue Stacy just got very angry, accused him of trying to frame her, and she stormed out. On her eldest daughter's Ashley's first day at college, investigators came in to tell her that it was found out that her father, Mike Wallace, died of antifreeze poisoning and not a heart attack. Investigators re recorded the phone call she then made to her mother. Mommy, they came to my freaking school. They came to your school? Are you okay? Um, I'm gonna be okay, but I'm really freaking out right now. Ashley was very panicked, very freaked out, as you can imagine. It's, I, I don't understand why they had to go to her college on her first day to do that, but okay. She's very panicked, and obviously Stacy was extremely panicked as well. She sensed that the police were seriously circling in on her. So, when Ashley returned back, Stacy decided that she would suggest a little mother-daughter drinking session to take the edge off as they were both very stressed and obviously Ashley was a, quite a bit older now, like she she wasn't a child so they could have a drink together really and they did. Stacy picked up some watermelon mimosa flavoured Smirnoff ice and Ashley would later say that this is the first time ever that her mum had ever like encouraged her to drink alcohol. She remembers that the drink tasted extremely nasty, not nice at all, but at the time she didn't have any reason to suspect her mum of anything. Why would she? They were so close. They were best friends. The Smirnoff ice made Ashley feel extremely ill, even though she hadn't drank that much to make her ill. Like, if you know Smirnoff ice, you know it's it's like 4%. It's not gonna do that much. So because she felt ill, her mother Stacy gave her a pill to sleep. And the next day, Ashley woke up feeling awful, very hungover, but she was fine. She went to school, but Stacy didn't stop there. Next day on September 14th, 2007, Stacy proposed to her daughter Ashley another little drinking session, except this time they, she wanted them to drink hard liquor. Investigators would later allege that Stacy knocked out her own daughter Ashley with drugs secretly mixed in a drink of vodka, orange juice and Sprite. Ashley actually initially refused this drink as it tasted so, so horrible, but Stacy used a teaspoon to put the drink down her, which is just very strange and I feel like, especially if she's never, if her mum's never really suggested drinking before this, this, like, it's very weird. 17 hours later, Ashley was found comatose, comatose I think it's called, which is a state of deep and usually prolonged unconsciousness, unable to respond to anything. She was found in bed by her younger sister Brie. Brie obviously demanded that they needed help and she 
made Stacy phone 911, so Stacy did phone 911. I need an ambulance. That's a problem. My daughter has taken some pills. Sounds like there's something in her throat. Conscious? Yes, she's making noise. Is she breathing normally? No. An entire bottle of vodka, Ashley. Is that her? Oh, she's throwing up. She's throwing up. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Ashley's little sister, Brie, left the room and then when she came back, she found a suicide note next to Ashley that contained a supposed confession to the murders of her own father and stepfather. Stacy quickly took the note and gave it straight to paramedics. Now, tests revealed that potentially fatal painkillers had been found in Ashley's system and that she was literally 15 minutes away from death. If they, if Brie had not have found her and got help, she would have died, but luckily she didn't. And when Ashley woke up, police obviously questioned her about the murders that she had just confessed to in a suicide note. Ashley was really, really confused and she said that the last thing she remembers was her mother making her an alcoholic drink, something she'd never really done before. And she told the officers that she literally had no idea what was going on. She did not write the note. And they could see she was clearly confused. Like, I'm going to read out the note and we'll talk about it a bit later. Mummy, when you read the letter, just remember I love you and everything I did is because I love you. I'm sorry all of this is happening to you, but now everyone is going to know what really happened and they know it wasn't you, it was me. No one was ever supposed to know about daddy. I told you when daddy died, it was all my fault and it was daddy who was doing things you never knew about. He was drinking when he was at Pick and Paul house and at Lisa's house, he was smoking pot again. I saw him. He was mean to you and me and he only ever loved Brie. I couldn't I didn't let him do those things to you anymore. You think I don't remember how things were, but I do, and I didn't want to ever live like that anymore. It wasn't fair to you or me. Daddy wasn't going to be good to you or ever be, ever only for Brie. I couldn't stand it anymore. The cops said that there was anti-free in Daddy's body, but did they tell anyone about the rat poison too when I got home from school that day? I knew that was going on. Daddy was barely breathing. I knew he was going to die. That's why I didn't call you for help or anyone else. I wanted to make sure he couldn't be mean to you or me anymore. He died before I went to pick Brie up from school. I watched him and I knew he couldn't hurt you anymore. Then we were happy for a while, it was just the three of us. And then you married David and he was mean to you. He was mean to all of us, meaner than Daddy. And I know you loved him, but you loved Daddy and you were going to let him treat you like he did and wouldn't leave. It wasn't fair, mummy. He didn't love you or me or Brie. I never thought anyone would miss David, no one, but you loved him. It was harder than with daddy because you were always home or with him, but I did it. I made sure he would never hurt you anymore. So that Friday when David came home so you could go to the post office is when I first did it. It was easy. I asked him if he wanted something to drink and I put the anti-free in his glass with some soda. He drank two whole glasses, that was it. Only it took longer with David than with daddy. Once I put anti-free in daddy's Gatorade, it only took a day or so. And that's when he died when you were sleeping on the couch after David locked himself in the room. I got the extra key because I knew where he hid it and I put stuff in the room. I tried to get him to drink some of that booze with the dropper thing, but he was out of it and wouldn't. I pulled the anti-free in the glass and on the floor and left the bottle in the room. Then I put the gloves back in the kitchen and got ready for work. You never knew. And I know all these cops are saying all of this stuff about you to everyone you know and mummy it's just not fair when you told me they dug daddy up i knew what was going to happen no one was ever supposed to know mummy and now they do and they think you did it but you didn't it was me when the cops came to my school today i thought they had figured it out and i was going to jail but they didn't take me mummy i can't live like this and watch what they're doing to you not anymore but i can't go to jail for the rest of my life i can't put you through that i did the only thing i could do to help you mummy i know you hate me for doing what i did but mummy remember i love you more than anything and i did it for you and for us please forgive me mummy someday when all of this is over please forgive me make sure you take care of brie she's all you have left now remember how happy we all were together and you'll be happy again i promise you mommy tell mm, i love him and i'm sorry tell brie to be a good girl for you and i love her too please don't hate me remember i love you ashley stacy told authorities that her daughter ashley had taken morphine and codeine on her own and left a 750 word suicide note confessing to these murders and next to Ashley's bed, there were empty bottles of sleeping pills and vodka. The motive? Well, you're probably all thinking what on earth would be her motive for killing her father and her stepfather. Now, Stacy said that her daughter Ashley's motive for doing so was that Ashley always resented her father, Mike, as he favoured Brie, the younger sister. And Ashley wanted to get rid of David, the second husband, as 
apparently he was mistreating Stacy. But Ashley, who was 12 years old when her father Mike died, said that they had a really good relationship, that her father went on Girl Scout outings with her, helped her win badges, and she said while her stepfather might have been difficult, she didn't and wouldn't have killed him. Forensic examinations of the home computer revealed that this suicide note had actually been wrote whilst Ashley was at school. Anyway, the same day, September 14th, 2007, Stacy was arrested at the hospital and charged with the murder of David Castor and the attempted murder of Ashley, her own daughter. Stacy later said, quote, I had a speeding ticket when I was 18 years old. That's the closest I've ever come to a brush with the law. So to be arrested and handcuffed, I was terrified. I just couldn't believe that that was happening. Stacey Castor's mother, Judy Eaton, did not believe that her daughter was guilty. She said, quote, they are blaming Stacey for this. I kind of went hysterical. I cannot believe Stacey had, has it in her to kill two men, especially men she's supposed to love. I do not believe Stacey did it. She would, and she would not frame Ashley. December 20th, 2007, Stacey was indicted, so formally charged. And September 25th, 2008, judge rules the death of Michael Wallace can be submitted as evidence. So obviously she was not being tried for her first husband's death, but that could be used as evidence, which literally could have made or broke the case. Like, if they didn't have that evidence, it would be so much harder to convict her because it could have been like a one-off thing but it's i mean two husbands don't die of antifreeze poisoning it's annoying that she wasn't charged with this but still anyway the trial then begun january 12th 2009 in syracuse new york before judge joseph fahey fahey reporters were not allowed inside the courtroom court attendants said that there wasn't enough room at that point fitzpatrick and garvey were was the attorneys for the prosecution, so obviously against Stacey. Now, Stacey Castor, aged 41 at this point, could face 25 years to life in state prison if convicted of murder. She could face a consecutive penalty of 25 years if convicted of trying to kill her daughter. She also could face further future prosecution in Cayuga, Cayuga County for the January 2000 death of her first husband Michael Wallace but that wasn't what this trial was about. Now we're going to talk about the trial so first of all the prosecution. It was obviously a very long trial so I'm going to talk about some main things. David Castor's hands were extremely grimy and his fingerprints were all over the glass that was on the nightstand. However the second glass which contained the antifreeze in there was no fingerprints of David's on there, only Stacy's. The suicide note, again, which claimed that Ashley had wrote to confess to the murders, like I said, was on Stacy's home computer when her daughter Ashley was literally known to be at school. They also obviously talked about the attempted murder on her daughter and saying how about the drink, what she gave her, what they found. Another thing in this suicide note was that she repeatedly threw out this note that Ashley wrote spelled antifreeze as antifree. And we know from when Stacy was being questioned, she accidentally called it antifree. Not like, ugh. David Castor's signature on a will, leaving his entire estate to Stacy and her daughters, was actually stimulated by someone trying to copy his writing. So it, it was not him that signed it. A family friend later on actually admitted that she and her husband falsely claimed that they had witnessed the signature. She said they signed the will a month after David Castor died and it was then backdated two years. The defence, so, the defence, wow, okay, so, Stacey's defence team were attorneys Charles Keller and Todd Smith. You can probably guess how they were gonna go about this. They obviously wanted to try and make it seem that Ashley had done these murders and that she had tried to take her own life as she confessed. They tried to do that. I feel absolutely awful for Ashley. Honestly, when you've gone through all that and then you literally have to go to court and people above you in the legal system are trying to 
accuse you and make it seem like it was you. Oh, it's absolutely awful. Ashley actually very bravely took the stand and confronted her own mother on the stand, which I don't know how she did that. I think that's absolutely just incredible. And on the stand, Ashley retold the story of how her mother had convinced her to drink before her near death. She repeated that she only drank the nasty tasting beverage because she trusted her mum. She maintained her innocence in the murders and denied writing the suicide note. Did you, when you were 12 years old, poison your father with antifreeze and rat poison no i did not and did you poison your stepfather with antifreeze in 2005 no i did not now stacy's defense team were mainly just set on creating reasonable doubt about stacy's roles in the murder so they weren't just going in there going oh ashley killed them ashley killed like they were just kind of going about it in trying to cause reasonable doubt. They wanted to poke holes in Ashley's version of revenge and they wanted to prove that she could be capable of murdering her own father at the age of 12, which I think is ridiculous. They obviously noted that their father, Mike, showed a lot of favouritism towards the younger daughter Brie and kept citing jealousy as a motive for Ashley to kill her father. Stacy's mother, so she actually, she actually even believed her own granddaughter was guilty. She Oh my god, it's crazy. She she believed Stacy, her daughter, and thought her granddaughter was guilty. In a final attempt to convince the jury that she was not guilty, Stacy took the stand, which is actually pretty rare in murder trials. Now, on cross-examination, prosecution pointed out what he felt were flaws in Stacy's version of that night. She maintained that it was Ashley who murdered the two men. Though she would not speculate about any possible motives of why her daughter Ashley would do this. The only reason she said was that her daughter was mentally ill. They pointed out that Stacey had never sought help for her mentally ill daughter Ashley and that Ashley never showed signs of mental illness. The prosecution also put out that Stacey's behaviour during David's and Ashley's illness was very strange, especially given the years that she'd worked for an ambulance company, remember? She did not seek care for Ashley for 17 hours, and she probably wouldn't have done if Brie hadn't discovered her sister near death. And she also indicated David, who was staggering and vomiting and severely unwell as looked okay, when he obviously didn't look okay. And likewise, they questioned how a woman who had already lost two husbands to poisoning would not seek help for her daughter. Ashley was in a state, why wouldn't she get help for her? Fitzpatrick frequently shouted at Stacey during the trial, causing her defence team to object and even request a mistrial, which didn't happen. Prosecutors brought up another bit of damaging evidence when they cited typing sounds on police wiretapes. During one of the recordings presented, typing sounds can actually be heard while Stacy talks to a friend, though she denied any memory of using her computer that day. Prosecutors argued that the typing sounds were those of the several drafts that Stacy had created of the suicide note that Ashley had supposedly wrote. And Ashley had already testified to having witnessed her mother working on the computer, which she had hidden to prevent Ashley seeing it. Fitzpatrick claimed that this was the day that Stacy wrote the note. And what's even more ridiculous is that none of Ashley's fingerprints were on this note, none of them only Stacey's. Stacey's defence team presented a pharmaceutical expert in an attempt to cast doubt on the prosecution's claim that Stacey had drugged Ashley 17 hours prior to being taken to hospital. I'm not sure why they did this because, I mean, they're just, they're just clasping straws here. On February 5th, 2009, Stacey was, thank God, found guilty of second degree murder in the poisoning of David Castor and of attempted second degree murder for overdosing Ashley. Stacey had her eyes closed while the verdict was read out. Defence announced that they would appeal the verdict, including challenging the inclusion of evidence regarding the death of Mike Wallace, which had not been charged. This never happened though. And on March 5th, 2009, Stacey had her sentence in. Prosecution asked Judge Fahey to impose the maximum consecutive sentences because of the brutality of David's death. However, she criticised how Stacey had 
partied in her backyard with friends like nothing was happening whilst her daughter Ashley was literally unconscious in her room. Prosecution said, quote, she is cold, calculating, and without any emotion for what she has done. Human life is sacred. Stacey Castor places no value on human life, not even her own flesh and blood. Stacey Castor, human beings are disposable. David's son, so David Jr., whom Stacey had cheated out of his inheritance, pleaded with the judge as well for Stacey to be severely pun punished. He said, quote, Your Honour, Stacey is a monster and a threat to society. She's created so much pain and death with this, creating multiples of pain and death in the families of those she has hurt. The judge told Stacey that she'd never seen a parent attempt to murder their child in order to set their child up for a crime that they themselves had committed and declared Stacey in a class all by herself, which is so true, it's absolutely shocking and ridiculous. The judge sentenced Stacey to the maximum of 25 years to life for the murder of David and to another 25 years for the attempt to kill Ashley. For forging David's will, he ordered her to serve an additional one year and a quarter to four years in prison. Fitzpatrick said that under New York sentencing guidelines, Stacey would have to serve just over 51 years before she becomes eligible for parole. And obviously due to her age, that, that is a life sentence, thank God. The trial had lasted about four weeks and an emotional Ashley told the judge that she hated her mother for ruining so many people's lives, but that she still loved her for the bond that she originally had with her, which absolutely breaks my heart. I hate my mother for ruining so many people's lives. I don't even know why she did it. What gave her the right to play God with people? And I hate her for having me be the one that found my dad. Just like her for having Bree found me. I never knew what hate was until now. Even though I do hate her, I still love her at the same time. That bothers me. It's so confusing. Breaks my heart. Poor, poor girl, honestly. On April 24th, 2009, ABC News actually aired a two-hour special about the trial. During the trial, Stacey had been dubbed the Black Widow by the media, which was a title previously given to Lynn Turner. Stacey, who professed to being sh completely shocked at the verdict, maintained her innocence during this special, as well as in unaired parts of the programme. She said that Ashley bought this on and insists that she and Ashley know what really happened. She did express sympathy for her daughter Brie. She indicated that her mother, stepfather and some other relatives still support her. Brie, like Ashley, never spoke to Stacey after the trial. She said that, quote, Though losing my mother was hard, I was happy that they said she was guilty because we all know that she's guilty. And Ashley said, quote, I would have done anything to her, but she tried to kill me instead. And both of Stacey's daughters expressed concern that their mother had not yet apologised to them. Which breaks my heart. I actually... Oh, it makes me so upset she tried to do that. I feel awful for Ashley, honestly. ABC also interviewed forensic psychologist Dr James Knoll about the case. He stated that while most suicide notes focus on themes of remorse and talking about how that person is not able to go on with life anymore. The note supposedly written by Ashley was simply just focused on taking the blame off Stacey, which is a very weird thing to write in a suicide note, full stop. He said that this theme was repeated 14 times in the note and that he believed Stacey would never admit her guilt. The code of murder is such as these, he said, is deny, deny, deny until the end. Though Stacey's not defined officially as a serial killer, it is likely that she would have killed again. James Knoll said that killers may have very different motivations. He described Stacey as a black widow type rather than a typical serial killer. He relayed that Psychopathic traits and histories of childhood abuse have been consistently reported in these women and suggested that if Stacey were guilty of the crimes of which she'd been convicted and accused of, then she would have been demonstrating psychopathic traits, including regarding even her own child as an object to be used to her convenience. I'm also going to talk about quickly Stacey's father's death. So, it is thought among many people and authorities that Stacey murdered her own father as well. It's not confirmed though, just saying it's not confirmed and we don't even know why she would do this. Like, there's not really a reason why, but it is very strange. So, in 2010, an investigation began into the mysterious death of Jerry Daniels' father, 
of Stacey. He died in February of 2002. Jerry Daniels was being treated in hospital for a lung alignment at St. Joseph's and he was making pretty good improvements. Now, the day he was meant to be released from hospital, his daughter Stacy came to visit him. Her father then died the next day. A witness says that Stacy bought her father an open can of soda, which is very strange. Why are you opening the can of soda? I mean, she might not have murdered him. There's no, we don't know any reason why she would have, but we also don't know any reasons why she would not have. And yeah, that is just very strange. Also, her father's remains were cremated at the request of his daughter, Stacey, which is weird considering we know that she likes to bury people, not herself, but you know what I mean? Like she had that plot ready for herself. Her past two husbands were buried because of her wanting to. And her father's estate and wealth was passed down to his daughter. Stacy. Very, very, very odd. The initial autopsy found his death to be of natural causes. However, the DA said that he would be investigating the accuracy of this report. The difficulty was that her dad had been created, making it hard to further determine an, an alternate cause of death. Michael Wallace, so her first husband, his relatives believe that it's no coincidence that Michael, David, and her father were buried next to each other in a plot purchased by Stacey Castor. Now, um, I know her father wasn't buried. I think maybe he was just like, had a sh thing there. I don't know. And they called it Stacey's Monument to Murder. And this plot was in Owasco Rural Cemetery. The investigation into her dad's death actually ended, unfortunately, when Stacey was found dead in her cell on the morning of June 11th, 2016. It was not immediately determined her cause of death, so it was listed as undetermined. It was later determined by DA's office that she died of a heart attack and there was no evidence of suicide or foul play. David Castor Sr's son, David Jr, had actually been seeking permission to move his father's remains to a new burial site. In court paperwork, David Jr had referred to the plot owned by Stacy as Stacy Shrine of Evil and said it was troubling to know that the woman who had murdered his father intended to be buried next to him. And after Stacy's death, he was granted this, thank God. And also on a GoFundMe page, one of Mike Wallace's relatives, so her first husband, is asking for help with the cost of a new headstone. They want one that does not mention Stacy's name on it because they literally have their names together and it says together forever. Why, oh my God. I'm gonna talk about the children now because I feel like that's important as they are victims as well. Since Stacy died in 2016, Ashley now has to live without an apology. She said in an interview to, with Oprah Mag in 2020, quote, I never got my answers because Stacy died. I know that I didn't do anything wrong. Since then, Ashley says that she has moved on with her life, but still struggles with the after effects of trauma. Oh my God, I feel awful for her. She credits her counselor, doctor and loved ones for her progress. She said, I quote, I would not be as far in life as I am if I gave up and turned to drugs or alcohol. She's done very well for herself. Today, Ashley still lives in New York and she's engaged to be married. She's focused on moving forward. She said, quote, as hard as it is to get up every day and put a smile on my face, I know that I have to, because if I don't, then Stacy won, which is so, so sad, honestly, but she's doing well. And we don't know too much about Brie, the younger daughter, but she seems to have moved on with her life as well. It's to my knowledge that she's based in Weedsport, New York, and she's concentrating on raising her own children. That is the end of today's case. An absolutely crazy, crazy case, in my opinion. Uh, oh my God, Stacey is a sick and twisted person, truly. And we need to remember her victims, David Castor. My heart goes out to your son. I know he's not gonna be, I know I say that, but like it's out of respect. It's not because I think they're gonna watch, but I feel awful for his son, honestly, I really do. Especially because they became quite close again. They began talking again. They made up after them years that they lost. And that must be awful, honestly. And also Michael Wallace, poor man, who literally turned his life around for his children. And even though she was not convicted of murdering her first husband Michael it's pretty clear isn't it I mean that is very clear and also her two daughters were victims as well remember their mother did this to their father and especially Ashley who literally had her own mother try to murder her 
and frame her for murder. You don't get much sicker than that, truly. Your own daughter, who you were literally like best friends with. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's case. Well, enjoyed hearing about it and all of that because I love talking about different cases, getting them out there. And it would mean a lot if you could subscribe and also leave a comment. Let's discuss things. Leave me case recommendations. And please give it a big thumbs up if you did enjoy.